some of your memories. Uh, well, these, you were talking about the uh, first building they had on Decatur Street mm -hmm. and about all the families living there. Mm -hmm. And one story that was told to me that impressed me was that Mrs. Udo, my mother-in-law, would take a red brick and she'd pound it into a powder. That was before Dutch cleanser. And this powder became a cleanser, and she oh, yeah? scrubbed those steps. I know she cleaned those steps, and I told you, like I said, and she wanted to clean the way she wanted because she was the first one there. And and then when my mother said, "Well, I can't do that," she says, "Well, you cook for me, and I'll do the steps." Uh, but I thought, and I every day they had, you know, somebody had to do the steps. Your mother got the better end of the deal. Because she, <laughs> she loved to cook. <laughs> and my mother-in-law loved to clean. She was a fanatic. And that was like a semen bar. It was still, that was uh, back in the 60s, early 60s, the semen, they were still hanging around the French Quarter. And things were changing. I mean, I seen the change. <laughs> my grandpa and his brother had a place on St. Philip and on the corner of St. Philip and Charters across the street from where I lived. And uh, he rented it, and then they closed it down for immorals, morals. And <laughs> it was because they were gay, and that's how bad it was back then for gay people. I mean, they shut them down. They took the liquor license from the building. So. A um, fella came in to the store and was going to rob the store, and he pulled out a knife, uh, which was kind of like the Italian style at the time, not guns, it was knives. So he says, give me the money in the register. And my grandfather picked up a stockfish. They called it stockfish. And it was a cod that was from Norway. It was air-dried. And they were usually about three feet long, and it looked like a piece of driftwood. It was hard as a rock. And he says, the first thing I'm going to do, and he's got the codfish in his hand, he's holding it by the tail. He says, the first thing I'm going to do is knock that knife out of your hand. He says, the next thing I'm going to do is beat you in the head with this with the stockfish in his broken English. Well, a guy ran out, and uh, then another incident, uh, someone came in to the store and, and picked a fight with my grandfather, and again, this man's in his 70s, and uh, my grandfather just went away and, and, and hit the guy and knocked him out, put him to the ground. This guy was about 30 years old. My grandfather's in his 70s, and, uh, and my dad tells my grandfather, he says, Pa, he says, you're going to get yourself in trouble. It's not always that easy. <laughs> the first block, Barrick Street, had a few black families, okay? Because Matassa had, a, had his, Mr. John Matassa had a grocery store and a bar, and they had a piece of plywood in the middle of the bar. A door over there for the blacks and a door over here for the whites. So they had, they had business for black people there. They have black people. That they can't, there wasn't no window where the black people had to go to the window. They used to come into the bar and sit down. But the piece of plywood would separate them. There were three brothers, and my grandfather was the oldest of those three brothers, Salvador, Philip, and John. They came here in the mid toward the late 1800s. And in the case of my grandfather, I don't know about the other two, my grandfather came alone at first and left his wife, who had newly married, in a convent in Sicily while he came over here to try to see if America was okay and, and he was going to be able to prosper here. So uh, when, in fact, he came here and spent a little time, he went back to Sicily and got his brothers and his wife and he came back here and set up himself in business. What kind of business was he in? He had uh, bars, and uh, he had uh, 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 import business, and a little prohibition. That was his particular interest, probably the best and biggest of his interests. He was in the wine and liquor business. You know, and you, know you ever heard about La Manna, Pano and Fallow? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the Italian funeral home. That's where they all went. I used to serve funerals there. I do funerals there every day with the priest. Yeah, the funeral, the funeral home. I mean, it was a, it was like where you went. You know, stay all night, eat, you know, and stay there and have food and all that kind of. 
You know, I don't want to say typical Italian funeral. That's what it was, a typical Italian funeral. And then they all got away from that. When my mom and daddy passed, we stayed all night. Yeah. It was closed to anybody else, but like years ago, you know, people that had restaurants and bars because everybody had a business, they would come at 2 o'clock in the morning to view the body and say their prayers, you know. But that was, that was a big... Uh, that was the big thing for Italian people. You no, know, my home. dad used to. My dad, well, my mother used home. to bring. I used to bring That's when I true. drove, and when that, my brother used to take, pick it up. My dad had his lunch every day. His mother, his wife, fixed it for him. In the cannery in L.A., I always brought the lunch from uh, where I was in Anaheim to Buena Park for Papa, Joe, and Frank. Mm -hmm. Why did I do that? <laughs> Because that's what they wanted. Oh, and that, well, when I started to drive, I remember every day, every day, I'd bring my daddy his lunch and my brothers in there. Try lunch. and find a, a wife who would do that now? Mm, <laughs> hell no. Oftentimes we'd go to uh, Louis Prima's mother's house on Canal Boulevard, and as guests there would be Harry James and Betty Grable. And, but I was a little kid, did I know? very much about all of that at that time, not too much, but I can remember having met them. And then being raised on Bourbon Street, I came to know all the famous musicians of Bourbon Street. Uh, along with Leon Prima, there was uh, Santo Pecora, there was Sharky Bonanno, there was Tony Almarico, there was Frank and Freddie Asunto, there was uh, uh, the Dukes of Dixieland, uh, and their father. Uh, there was uh, uh, the Basin Street Six with George Gerard and Pete Fountain. That's when I first met Pete. I met Al Hurt then as I became a little older. So going into my teenage years, I came to meet a lot of those guys. The famous Roy Zimmerman, the pianist. Uh, just a ton of local New Orleans musicians that played up and down clubs on Bourbon Street. Oh, and my grandpa also owned the Gaiety, the Gaiety Show, Ursuline and Royal Street. And the local people called it the Gallic Theater because it was all Italians. <laughs> The French Quarter was very vibrant for young people. It was like a great playground. It's a Cabrini playground. We all played ball there. We played ball in our own schoolyard uh, uh, yards. Uh, St. Mary's Italian. They had a boxing gym back there, and they had ball fields right out in the next to the school building. St. Louis Cathedral. In addition to that, there were the dancers. The CYO dances were a big thing, a big affair in New Orleans, and particularly in the French Quarter, because we had St. Mary's at the newly created gym on, uh, on uh, Charters and uh, Governor Nichols. There's a fantastic gym built for kids in the French Quarter. Had a swimming pool, had a basketball court. My uncle started that program, the uh, boxing program at St. Mary's. He was the pastor. Uh, there and later on became past St. Louis Cathedral. Uh, his name was Father Verderami. And he had such, in the, fifth, in the 50s, he was, you know, a young stud himself at the time. And he had so many young men that had no direction and that were always fighting on the streets and whatnot, like this guy right here. And uh, he decided to, to uh, start up a boxing program. So, but St. Mary's was where everybody went. They had the St. Mary's gym, which the people of the, the Italian people in the neighborhood paid for, out their pocket, and now the, the Archdiocese and sold it, but that's another story. And uh, they used to have the fights, and they had <clears throat> all kind of things at the, uh, at the gym. They, uh, in fact, the, the St. Mary's gym produced, the, the, the gym behind the church produced Willie Pastrana, the light heavyweight champion in the world from 63 to 66, and Ralph Dupas, who was a middleweight, champion of the world in 56. And uh, so a little bit of place put out two world champions back then.
Now, the most unusual and kind of special delicatessen, though, other than Progress and Central, was Montalbano's. Montalbano was predated both of them, and it was tiny, but it was so special. And he was a real Sicilian, had fought in the Sicilian army, and uh, had a, a new Garibaldi and all of that. I mean, all kind of tales you would hear when you were a little kid and you went there. And when you went there, it had a great big giant wheel of cheese on the counter. It smelled so good and it looked so good. It was just oozing oil, you know, fresh cheese. And when he would make a muffalata, the kids would go there, we'd put our nickels and pennies together. We'd go there and say, Mr. Montalbano, Mr. Montalbano. And he'd say, well, let's see what you got. And we'd show him what we had. He'd make the sandwich according to how much money we had in our hand. You know, we'd gear it to how many slices of this or that. And say, give me another six cents. Mr. Give, give us another slice of Swiss cheese, you know, or something we'd say if we came up with a little more money. He was right across the street from McDonough 15. Uh, he was unique. He sold muffaladas about a pound. And he, he did do a lot of tourists. Uh, I've seen him back in the early 50s. I've seen him sell muffaladas for over $75 a sandwich. Of course, they were huge. You couldn't, you couldn't. Uh, I'll put it to you this way. It will put any corned beef sandwich from New York to shame as far as height and volume. That's how big he used to make his muffaladas. It was all cut by hand. Too. All cut by hand and sold by the pound. And candles lit all over the place in tribute to St. Joseph. While you were waiting for your muffalata sandwich, you'd push the candles to you so you had to come up with a buck and burn one, you know, for your family. <laughs> it smelled like heaven in there, Italian heaven. <laughs>
that's was their market, and that was a big loss for them. They didn't have to go out way out to the suburbs to you know to get groceries. During my father's time, it was an extremely interesting place and a lot of things taking place. But in my day, it still was terribly interesting. There still were butchers and fishmongers in the market. There still were famous uh, uh, restaurants in the market. True Jacks was very prominent. Uh, Battistella's had a restaurant. It was very prominent seafood and breakfast place. Excuse me. There was a man named Lala, again in Albanese, who had the most famous barbecue place, barbecue pork and chicken. It was like unbelievably delicious sandwiches on a seeded loaf of bread, Italian bread. Uh, Italian that, bread and barbecue. Unbelievably delicious Italian loaf with sesame seeds, sliced pork barbecue and chicken barbecue, as delicious as you've ever tasted. He sold out almost every night. That's how good it was. And uh, who else was down there? Uh, uh, oh, uh, Roma Restaurant was a tiny little restaurant next door to the French Market Bar that had the most delicious food. And guys would come there every day for a special. Wednesday was tripe day tripe special. It was so delicious. I went there every Wednesday to get a big bowl of tripe. 